The coronavirus pandemic has now spread to more than 200 countries and regions. On Wednesday, the head of the World Health Organization, or WHO, predicted a death toll of epic proportions. Over the past five I weeks, we have witnessed a near exponential growth in the number of new cases, reaching almost every country, territory and area. The number of deaths has more than doubled in the past week. In the next few days, we will reach 1 million confirmed cases and 50,000 deaths. The United States has the most coronavirus cases in the world, almost double the next country. Nearly 2,400 people have died here in New York, New Jersey and Connecticut, half the national total. More than 1,300 of those deaths were here in New York City. With the nation's health care system already stretched to capacity and protective gear in short supply, President Trump and his health advisors say more than 100,000 to 240,000 yes. Americans could die from the coronavirus over okay. the next weeks. This is White House Coronavirus Coordinator Deborah Burke speaking on Tuesday. Slope. So as mortality, the fatalities to this disease will increase, and then it will come back down, and it will come back down slower than the rate at which it went up. And so that's, that is really the issue, how, how much we can push the mortality down. Yeah. This comes as millions of people have lost their jobs. Last week's unemployment claims saw the largest single-week increase in unemployment claims in American history, times five, with an estimated 3.3 million people filing for benefits. Another 5 million claims are expected to be filed this week. For more, we're joined by Robert Weissman, president of Public Citizen, who's been following all of this very closely from his home in Washington, D.C., where he's joining us now, again from his home, where he can protect himself, his family, and stop community spread. Rob, I'm so glad to be talking to you, but not under these circumstances. Can you start off by just responding to the president, this week for the first time admitting the enormity of the crisis that we're in? The latest news, Li Fang of The Intercept writing that the U.S. was exporting military equipment as late as March 17th. Um, president Trump now admitting we're talking about 100,000 to a quarter of a million Americans dead in the next weeks. Um, can you start off by just responding to this and then talking about um, the so-called stimulus bill that was passed, uh, Nancy Pelosi um, saying they need a second one, and Mitch McConnell um, saying there's no way that's going to happen. Talk about the state of this country right now. Well, thanks, Amy. It's, it is great to be with you, and, of course, not how we'd like to do it. You know, when it comes to Trump, we've called for him to resign as a clear and present danger to the public health of the country. Um, you know, we support his impeachment, but this is a whole different thing. It's not hard to be a leader in times of crisis. It calls on you to do great things or even mediocre things. Um, the script is pretty well written for you, but he can't follow it because he doesn't have empathy for other human beings. Every, everything that happens on the planet for him is about him. And as a result, we've had disastrous leadership. Uh, the utter failure of the government to take leadership in treating this as the wartime emergency that he says it is, you know, to make sure that we produce masks for people who need them. It is not a hard thing to do, to make sure we have ventilators for everyone who needs them. We did not have a proper stockpile, but we should have moved at a national wartime footing to move into production to get sufficient ventilators. We were able to do it in World War II 70 years ago. We're far more technologically advanced. It's crazy that it hasn't happened. And it hasn't happened because we don't have national leadership. We don't have a leader who is able to speak in terms of solidarity and bringing us together, even as we're isolated, which is exactly what we, re what we need right now. Uh, and we don't have a leader who's able to acknowledge the science and tell the truth. He's come around in the last few days, and hopefully he'll stay there. But his months-long failure to acknowledge what's going on, 
obviously and clearly has set the nation on a far more deadly trajectory than it would otherwise be on. So it's hard to say enough bad things about how the president has, has handled this. And it didn't have to be. This is not about how progressive you are. Um, you just have to be someone who understands what it is to be a leader in times of crisis, do the things that need to be done. And he is utterly incapable of doing that. Obviously, this has rocked the economy and it's going to get worse and go on for we don't know how long. I think it's a mistake to only think about the worst case scenarios, but the worst case scenarios are certainly very frightening. The Congress has done some extraordinary things and some really pretty bad things in response. This last relief or stimulus bill that was just passed called the CARES Act was extraordinary to, and to the extent of its size and the speed with which Congress acted. So it's a $2 trillion bill that will actually make available about $6 trillion to the economy. Um, for a first cut, that's pretty good at scale. It does a lot of good things in terms of getting money out to states, getting monies out to hospitals, and having a very strong unemployment um, program. So as people are being thrown off their jobs, they're going to be able to get, apply for and get unemployment that will give them 100% of what they were making, at least for the, next, for the next four months. There's a lot of bad stuff in that bill, too. It was pretty clear how it should have been structured. If there was a decision made that we need to keep businesses intact, which I think is a reasonable call, they need financing to get through this time because we want them to maintain, remain as going concerns and we want the economy to keep functioning. The number one thing we wanted out of them was to keep people on the payroll. And this, pro this program does not require businesses to keep people on the payroll as a condition of receiving government loans. It has some conditions that are included um, so that companies can't spend the money they get on uh, dividend payments and stock buybacks. However, it permits the Treasury Secretary to waive those conditions if he sees fit, and we can't feel very good about how that's going to go. Robert Weiss, um, as you mentioned, uh, millions of people are unemployed. Millions more are expected to lose their jobs. Uh, and what is happening at the scale and the scope of these job losses are reportedly unprecedented uh, in U.S. history. And to take just one example of the scale of the loss, uh, the U.S. Travel Association has warned that the U.S. tourism industry will be, the loss to the U.S. tourism industry will be more than $900 billion, which is seven times what it was following 9-11. Meanwhile, many observers are drawing comparisons between what's likely to happen as a result of this and the Great Depression not just the recession of 2008, but the Great Depression. What kind of response do you think could compensate for what millions and millions of Americans are going to suffer in the long term? Right. Well, the, there is no parallel to this in terms of the, the scope um, and that it affecting every single person in the United States and every single person around the world. We are, in fact, shutting down huge portions of the economy. So it's different than the Great Depression or even the Great Recession. The market or the system's not working. We've got an external problem, and we're making an intentional, appropriate, and necessary decision to shut down economic activity. The only force that can solve that problem is the government. So this first stimulus bill is a partial response. Um, but obviously, when you have a total problem, you really need a total solution. I'm starting with people who are the most vulnerable, have the least possible cushion. So providing unemployment insurance is great. It doesn't adequately deal with the problem of all kinds of people who've been outside of the workforce all along, but we're able to get by one way or another and who are not likely to be able to get unemployment insurance. It does, doesn't take care of uh, you know, the issues you're raising about prisoners uh, and other super vulnerable segments of society. We've got a, a massive population of immigrants and especially people who are undocumented we're going to have a lot of trouble accessing some of the financial supports that are available. Um, and it, people are going to fall through the cracks. So and it, we got to get more money out, um, and we need protections for people to be able to stay in their homes. Um, the, the, the bill that passed does a lot for people who are homeowners to help give them some break on mortgage payments. It doesn't adequately deal with renters, um, who are obviously generally going to be lower income than the class of mortgage payers. A lot of localities and states are taking are trying to address the 
the rent problem, uh, but not all of them. So a lot of people are going to be really stuck unless we have much stronger moves forward to protect all people.